between 1995 and 2005, for 10 years, I did research at Harvard University in the area of memory functioning. The work wasn't about the part of research most of us, about memory that most of us accept. It wasn't about how people can come to forget things that happened. The research was about how people can come to remember things that didn't happen. So I get asked all the time, why would someone like you go into that area? I went into it because it was exciting. At that time, most experts in the field of memory thought that memory worked like a video camera, you know, accurately recording everything and then playing it back perfectly. And faculty at Harvard were on the cutting edge of challenging that idea about memory functioning. They, along with colleagues all over the world, were collecting data that showed that our memories are fragile. Our memory systems are fundamentally flawed and we are vulnerable to creating false memories of things that didn't happen and distorting the memories that we do have. So it was exciting. And also this was research that had immediate real world implications. So for example, consider eyewitness testimony. How many people get put in prison based on what eyewitnesses see? This was the kind of research that challenged this. We can't rely on people's memories. No matter how detailed they are, no matter how real they feel, data shows that these memories could be wrong. It was good times for me back then. The research was exciting. I got media attention. Uh, I got to be an expert witness in high profile cases. I got to meet, um, I got to meet Larry King. I got to meet uh, Peter Jennings. Um, and best of all, I got to be on the TV shows I loved so much, like National Geographic and Discovery Channel. And why would I be on those shows? Because Apparently, lots of people are interested in alien abductions and UFOs. And any time there was a show on that, they wanted the memory expert to come in and explain how a normal person could come to believe they were kidnapped by a little green man and then sexually and uh, medically experimented on. So that's how I ended up on those shows. But unfortunately, all good things tend to have to come to an end. And the backlash hit. The backlash was people don't like having their memories challenged. People, you, me, if we have a memory and it feels real, we don't want anybody telling us that it's not true. So what happened is, oh, and who else doesn't like it? It turns out psychotherapists and criminal professionals don't like having the techniques that they use to help you get back your memories challenged either. So, Hate mail starts rolling in. Uh, oh yeah, talks start getting boycotted. I think the worst for me was in a New York Times article, a really prominent psychotherapist that I admired a lot in Boston said, my research along with my colleagues was biased. Why? We had a political agenda. We were trying to silence victim stories. And this was super confusing for me because I was just a researcher. All I did was collect data and then the data showed memories were not to be trusted. I had no political agenda. So I was young, I was thin skinned, and I decided I am just getting out. I'm getting out and I ran away. You know how far I went? All the way to Nicaragua. <laughs> really far, and I found a new home at Inkai, and I love my new home. And I found a new area of research, and I love this area of research, and I vowed 10 years ago that I was never gonna talk about memory functioning again. So the question is why 10 years later am I talking about memory functioning? I've asked myself that a lot and I think first I blame the students. I blame the Inkai students, it's your fault because they asked me to and one of the reasons I'm here is because I admire the students. I am blown away by how hard they work, about their vision, about what they're able to accomplish and I didn't want to say no. The second reason is, as I'm getting older, I'm increasingly becoming aware that perhaps the field of memory research has something to say about, about leadership decision making. Even though those fields never overlap, maybe they should. Maybe this work could better inform leaders' decisions. So what would I like to tell current and uh, future leaders? I would like to say that you cannot trust your memories or other people's, no matter how real they feel, no matter how many details they have, no matter what emotions they bring about, you can't trust them. 
because there's something wrong with you? No, because 30 decades, th 30, three decades of solid data from the fields of cognitive neuroscience, social, experimental psychology show that our memory systems are fundamentally reconstructive in nature, that our memories distort and decay and change over time, and that in many cases, false memories can be created. So let me make this less abstract. Here are three ways that your memories are getting messed up. One, they're getting messed up at the point of encoding when they get into your head. This is because you could perceive an event differently from what actually happened. So imagine you're mugged. I'm sorry to have to have you imagine that, but imagine you're mugged and you're held up at gunpoint. And because of shadows in the room, you see that mugger as being very dark skinned. And at that moment, that gets into your head, that you got mugged by a dark-skinned person. It wasn't dark-skinned person, but your perceptual systems are fallible, and that's what got in. Then, even if you encode a memory perfectly correctly, memories bias and change over time. This is what Dan Schachter, in his seminal book, The Seven Sins of Memory, calls bias. When you have new experiences, new ideas, new beliefs, it changes the memories that you have from the past. So for example, imagine after you got mugged in El Salvador, you learned a lot about gang violence and the problems they're facing. And then you learned that you got mugged in a part of the city where uh, one of the gangs, Barrio 18, uh, tends to mug their victims. You may start to change the content of your memory. Suddenly now, the mugger is beginning to look like a gang member. Suddenly now, maybe you're even remembering that he might have had a tattoo. Your memory is changing over time. The third way your memories are getting messed up is when you retrieve them, when you pull them out. Why does that happen? It happens because we as human beings are super suggestible. We're easily influenced by what other people say to us. So imagine if the police who interviewed you after the mugging said, was that, get, was that person who mugged you really tall, like six foot or more? Guess what? You're now more likely to think he was tall. Another example, imagine there's a car crash. Two cars hit. You want to know how fast the cars were going when they hit. If you ask the witnesses how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other, the witnesses are going to report that the car was going faster than if you had used the word hit. They're also going to be more likely to report that there was broken glass and blood. So that is how suggestible we are. Now, many of us can be like, okay, so I understand the memories I have, they could be a little wrong, I could screw up some details, but there's no way that I could create an entirely false memory. And I would have to tell you that you're wrong. This is how it happens. It happens when you are asked to vividly imagine something that didn't happen. Just imagine it. Lie down on that therapist's couch or just at home at night in bed. Imagine it. Imagine all the details. And it turns out, after a while, you can get confused between stuff you imagined and stuff you read in a book or watched on TV and saw in a movie. This is called source monitoring problems. All of us may have information, a fact, like what's the GDP of your country, but you could forget where you learned that. Did you read it in a book? Did your professor tell you? Did your mother tell you? You get forget about the source. So when we're in a situation that if we imagine something, we can over time forget whether that thing, that memory we imagined, was what we watched, what we read, what somebody told us, or whether it actually happened. So to make it less abstract, let me give you an example. Were you attacked by a rabid dog when you were 10 years old and had to go to a hospital? I'm going to go with probably not. But here's the thing. If you give me 20 minutes with you in a dark room, or I ask you to imagine being attacked by a rabid dog going to the hospital, I ask you to think about the details, you emerge more likely to think it happened. And then three months later, you're even more likely to think it happened. And then one year later, one out of four research participants now believes they were attacked by a rabid dog. Let me give you another quick example. I'm going to give you seven words that I want you to study and remember. Don't write them down. That would be cheating. Just remember them. Here they are. Sugar, sour, bitter, candy, cookie, cake. All right, here's my question. Was the word cake on that list? Was the word sweet on that list? Some of you will say yes. In fact, 50% of people will say yes. They saw the word sweet. 
they didn't see the word sweet. Why do they think they saw the word sweet? Because when they were studying the other words, they were associated to the idea sweet, so it popped into your head. And at that moment it popped in your head, you now get confused between what you generated and what you actually studied. So it is a real world instant example of how source monitoring occurs and how we confuse stuff we managed with stuff that we studied or heard. So in the end, Memory is a lot more like a Wikipedia page than a video camera. Why? Because what's on that Wikipedia page might be wrong, and over time, it can be changed by you and by other people. So in conclusion, what's the takeaway for business leaders? I think the takeaway from business leaders is you have a responsibility to make decisions for better or for worse that serve the interest of all of your stakeholders. And when you make those decisions, do not base them on your memories or your beliefs, no matter how strong and detailed they feel. Why? Because they might be wrong. And finally, in a weird way, I feel like I've come full circle in my career. What do business practitioners and memory scientists have in common? Is that all of us, as we go through our life, have to base our theories about the world and our decisions not on feelings, memories, assumptions, but on facts, things that can be independently corroborated. Facts things that other people can see, things that other people can touch or feel. Why do we want to base our decisions and our theories on facts? Because data, facts are solid, and your memories might not be. Thank you very much.